the build-up of the lesson, I, I was thinking about quite a few things of how to get up to another type of topic or what to speak about. And as I was thinking about it, I was, oh, the brave man himself is here, Tehia. I was thinking about this clown for some reason. And I was thinking about, uh, whenever I think of him, I think about the 4x4 four four weekend. And as I was uh, thinking of what to speak about, it actually, I don't want to mention this one because he did well this 4x4 uh, four four weekend, but the previous one where we were towing Tehia out all the time, the 4x4s four were pulling him out and so forth. And it kind of just brought to me this, this fantastic topic and that we actually spoke about, uh, there was a night that we spoke about on, the, on this past 4x4 four four weekend that actually brought it all into sort of into one unit. And um, as we go through this evening, I'll basically explain what the topic is and so forth. But before I start, there was a, once a little Sunday school class that goes and all the children had to write a letter to God. So the one child writes to God and he says, uh, Dear Lord, thank you for my baby brother. But in my prayer, I specified I want a puppy. So uh, it, it was quite cute. And there was several others that were quite cute. And uh, this was from little Joyce. Uh, but I hope that this evening what I have prepared for you somehow just uh, sort of applies to you in some way. Um, I tell you one thing that if you're sitting here, I can definitely say that it applies to each and every one of us. And uh, before we start, let us quickly bow our heads in prayer. Our Father God, we want to say thank you for bringing us here tonight. Father God, the fact that we can come here and spend time with family. Father God, we know that we got our blood family, but Father God, we know that you have blessed us with this unit over here where we can come to, Father, and just think about you and what you've called us to do. And so, Father, at this time we pray, Lord, that you please bless us as we go through this evening. We pray this through your Son's name. Amen. Before uh, we go anywhere, I want to ask that we all turn to 1 Corinthians. This is where we're going to be based tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And... Uh, as I was thinking about the lesson, I, it, it was quite almost heartening because what I've got to say tonight is it's, it's speaking about unity. And sometimes when we speak about unity, we think about one sort of team of people thinking in the same direction with the same goal, everybody getting on along well because all, we all know that a, a well-lubricated chain works together and works well at uh, what the final goal is. But tonight what I want to speak about is not about a team that works together that is well-oiled and everybody is uh, happy with each other. I'm going to speak about unity in diversity. If we think about today, we're sitting in a world where we've got so many different ideas, so many different ways of thinking. And at the end of the day, we're sitting with a lot of people that have got different views and all diverse backgrounds. I think one of the things that's almost opened my eyes to this, if I sometimes sort of think of marriage, I was at a wedding last night with Elroy, and you look at the different backgrounds in their lives, it is so interesting to see how different backgrounds bring out different people, and to see that in marriage, somehow you've got to dovetail these things and, and bring apart a couple. This evening, I want to speak about, obviously, like I said, uni unity and diversity, but the Bible highlights this sort of scene in a very clear way, and I want us to read this together comes out of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to be reading from verses 12 through to 20. It says, The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all of the parts are many, they, are, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Now the body is made up of one part, uh, sorry, not made up by one part, but of many. If the foot had to say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would, it would rather, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, the... But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there were many parts, but one body. And if I think about it, for instance, that weekend, it was quite interesting to see how different parts of the church just somehow got together. You would find that there are these different groups of people. Yes, there are those that choose to chat with each other more than others. But at the end of the day, you sat with this unit that sat around a fire 
and all laugh together, at, well, sometimes, if you weren't the person receiving it. But it was all fantastic at the end of the day. This evening, I hope it works. I've asked Stevie, there's a video that illustrates it so fantastically. I, I don't know if you've ever thought of what life is like for an ant. It must suck. But here's a little ant that I don't know what movie it's from, but it, it, he sort of explains it himself. I don't know if you've ever thought of uh, or watched one of these ant movies. I don't know where that comes from. But I thought it would kind of put uh, the nail on the head as to what life is about. If you think about it, we have unfortunately gotten to the point where it's all about primitive and it's about the survival of the fittest and who is the lion and who is the underdog. And unfortunately, that is what our world has gotten to. I went and looked up for the meaning of the phrase unity and diversity. And uh, I know it's not a very reliable one, but Wikipedia came up with something quite nice. It says that unity in diversity is a concept of unity without uniformity and diversity without fragmentation. I want us to read that again because that's quite a lot of words, big words. Unity in diversity is a concept of unity without uniformity and diversity without fragmentation. Sometimes we get into groups where we want people to almost be as focused as us or to be like us in our thinking. Sometimes we choose to be in groups that will always say yes when we want them to say yes and say no when we want them to say no. But unfortunately, when we deal with different units, and especially the church, that is not the case. We're sitting with a whole vast group of people that, yes, a lot of the times do not agree with each other. But at the end of the day, we've got one goal that we have got to achieve together, even with our differences. And that goal is Christ and also his glory. Christ gave us his command and what he design, desires for us is to live for him and also to make more disciples. But at the end of the day, if we can't look past diversity and somehow form unity in that, we are never ever going to reach that as a unit. We might try and uh, get there on our own, but it might not be as successful. Diversity is often seen as a negative. Sometimes we see procrastination, or no, sorry, not procrastination, but exclusions out of groups because you are not of the same mindset or the same uh, thought. Something that also is seen very negative when we think of uh, diversity is that it causes fights and fragmentations, as the, the explanation said. A guy once said after fighting with his friend, he said, listen, I'm going to be the bigger man here, and he says, we're going to agree to disagree, and we'll walk away, and then we'll wait for God to show you who was right. And, uh, and then he says, obviously, God will say that I was right. So sometimes that is our outlook on life. Sometimes we think, you know, we're going to have these fights and quarrels, and it's, it's always, our, always our position, and our position is right. But often, sometimes we find that neither of us are correct. At the end of the day, God's got his uh, ideas, and, and that's normally what's, uh, what should stand. Diversity can also be a very powerful thing. It's something that can be very beautiful. And what I want you to think about now, if we think of diversity, let's think about the time of Noah, the time that he got onto the, onto the ark. You think about how much diversity there was on that boat, that uh, 30 days and 30 nights or 40 days, or however long it was. If you think about all the diversity on there, it was all for the one common goal, and that was to save the beauty of, of what God had created. And so if you think of it now, us just as humans, we need to somehow have that same mindset that God instilled in Noah, bring everything together into one uh, single, single boat. There's also another uh, sort of diversity that would, I think, yeah, man and woman is another diversity. 
obviously today's society we get many people that want to go against the grain but the diversity in man and woman is something perfect it's something that you can't go against the grain and obviously that is what god has created i want us to further then in first corinthians chapter 12 and we'll be reading from verses 20 through to uh, 31 from verse 20 it says as it is there are many parts but one body the eye cannot say to the hand I do not need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I do not need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the part that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor, and the parts that are un uh, unpresentable are treated with special modesty. I want you to think about that. Sometimes we are very guilty of that, where sometimes we perceive certain people to be more important than others. I think it is one of the most ill-conceived things that our world does. And unfortunately, it is something that gets drawn into the church. Other people are seen as more important than others, and it doesn't matter what their different roles are. At the end of the day, Christ sees us all equally important. The one thing that many people dislike is hearing that, because sometimes people like to think that they are more important than the next person. But Christ, at the end of the day, says that that is not the case. I was thinking about it today. If we had to think about one per person is more important than the other, I want you to imagine a group of guys uh, trying to present what the ladies presented yesterday. Or was it Yeah, yesterday. What a beautiful day. Can you imagine guys who thought that they were more important, they had to do everything? I think it would turn out not as beautiful, or a little bit of a flop. And so it's something that we need to come to terms with. Nobody is more important than the next person, and it's something that we need to seriously think about. What we also need to think about quite seriously is what are we bringing to this unit? Let's say the unit right now is all of us sitting in this church trying to strive for that one goal, and it is to, to, to fight for more souls, not for our own self-images or for our own pockets or whatever it is. Our goal is to reach more people for Christ. And so I need to ask, or we need to ask ourselves, what are we currently doing to strengthen this unit? What are we doing to try in the evenings to fill this section of the church? What are we trying to do to actually try and reach more people for Christ? And if we don't have an answer for that, we need to honestly be critical to ourselves and say, well, that needs to change. With the church, with such rich diversity, we can reach so much more. That's something that I think many people don't see. People sometimes look at themselves and say, well, I don't know what I could offer to this church. At the end of the day, you know what? There are many people that you can reach that I will never ever see in my life. There are people that each and every one of us here will come into contact with that we will never ever see. And that is why Christ says that we are all equal. And it is up to us to reach those people for Christ. One of the things that we need to see is that even with such rich diversity, we can even become that much stronger as a unit. Because with our diversity, we reach those other people. Just today, I was thinking about the successes of what our churches actually come about with the diversity. Yes, there have been times where it didn't seem so united and it didn't seem so strong. But at the end of the day, we think of the many things that have been developed. We've got the youth, we've got the young adults, which has now become a fantastic strong group. We've got KFC, there's puppets, prison ministries, sounds, media, all of those different ministries that have come up there. And sometimes we look at that and we see, well, is that all that the church has done? We have covered a lot of ground in a very quick, in very quick succession. And so we need to ask ourselves the question, what are we going to do to increase that list? What are we going to do to try and draw more people? There's, a, there's one key point that I think that we need to pick up. And this is something that I want us to quickly read through. Let us quickly finish the rest here in, in 1 Corinthians, then we'll go further. From verse 22, On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem weaker are indispensable, and the parts that think that are, that are less honorable we treat with special honor, and the parts that are indispensable we treat with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, 
but that the parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is, is honored, every part rejoices with it. If I read that little verse right there, you know what I'm reminded of the times that we came and had prayer evenings here. The times that Auntie Lee Grunewald had the, the aneurysm, was it, no, it was aneurysm. There were many times that we've come and prayed for each other. There's many times that we've gone to other churches to pray for, each, uh, pray for each other. And it wasn't individuals going there for self-seeking, trying to say, well, I'm coming to support you. It was a church decision that we were going to pray together. And that is something that we need to start looking at. How are we going to draw people closer? Let us go further. From verse 27, now you, are body, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you uh, of its part, uh, a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed first all the apostles, second the prophets, third the teachers, then workers of uh, miracles, and those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts and, and of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are you apostles? Are you prophets? Are you teachers? Do all work miracles? Do you have gifts of healing? Do we all speak in tongues and do we all interpret? But, but eagerly desire the greater gift. And now I will show you the most excellent way. Sometimes we often downplay ourselves. Sometimes we almost don't think that we're blessed with a gift. That is something that we've also got to look at. I'm telling you, in the youth, I've come across it so many times, and it's quite strange that sometimes it's the women that think it mostly, that they are not blessed with anything. At the end of the day, God has blessed us with something. Whatever it is, God's blessed you with something. And it is not for yourself, but it is for the greater of his kingdom and to reach more people. I want us to quickly go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. It's the last flip that you'll do for the night. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. And the reason why I want us to read this verse together is because it picks up on a very key point that I think is almost convicting in, in at least my heart. First Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, Each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God, varied, a God-varied grace. Now, if you, I want to, want to go through once again and, and pick up on the place where I exclaim, each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another. And so sometimes we say, well, I don't know what my gift is. God has blessed you with a gift. Use it for the greater of his kingdom. One thing that is also quite convicting, and it's something that I definitely struggled with when, when, in the beginning when I started working with the youth, is that sometimes we want people to come to us. And we want people to say to us that, you know, I need you. I need you to do this for the church. I need you to do that. At the end of the day, God expects us to go out there and look to be servants of him. Sometimes we expect people to come to us and say, well, please, can you come and serve us with your great talents? That's not the case. We need to be the ones that step up and say, well, I can go and I want to see what I can offer to the church and see how we can grow it. At the end of the day, it comes down to this that we need to sit and decide, do we want to see this church grow? And if the answer is yes, we need to say, well, how are we going to get there? It's not going to get there by uh, pointing fingers and saying, that person's not doing that or that person's not doing this. At the end of the day, it comes down to you as an individual and say, what are you going to do to contribute to it? Christianity and this church is about its members. If I want you to think of it right now, you guys know all these unions. I don't know if any of your employees belong to unions. You hear about it all the time. But I want you to think of this for a second. Each union that is popped up, it is for its members, not for people around. Christianity in this church is one for its members, but most importantly as well, it is to reach those out there not only for its members. And so when we have joined this unit over here, we need to come out of the mindset that we have joined this uh, exclusive group that is just for, about each other. It is not about that. It is about going out there and reaching more. And it is about bringing all of our talents in here so we can reach out there. Again, I was reminded today, I said to the youth, that sometimes we see the church as perfect people. I asked the youth this morning about, uh, what do you think of when you think of Christianity or a Christian? 
the things that popped up was that it is a perfect person or it is a person that just follows Christ 100%. At the end of the day, Christians that are here, it is not about the perfect, but it is about coming here and almost having a hospital for the sinners. That is why when we think about diversity and unity, we need to look at each other as humans. Sometimes we look at each other as they're supposed to be perfect people. We need to look at each other as struggling people, as humans, so that we can form one tight unit to reach the end goal. I pray that as we go through this rest, the rest of this week and also as we have, a, have an outlook on the church, that we never ever look and try to point fingers. But instead of trying to be a focal or almost an important part of trying to get this whole machine working for what God wants us to do, not about we, what we want to do with the church.